That's a disgrace. It's wrong. Right. It's just wrong. So, and yeah. everybody, everybody, everybody sees that the fix is in. That was former Senator and Secretary of State John Kerry slamming the hearing of Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and the GOP majority for not interviewing Mark Judge, who was allegedly in the room when Professor Christine Blasey Ford was assaulted. And Secretary Kerry joins me now. He has a new book, his fourth, Every Day is Extra. It's available now, third week on the New York Times bestseller list. Thanks so much for being here. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. It's good to well, see you again. I'm happy to be here. How are you Thank doing? You. Doing great. Yeah. Fabulous. Feel great. So yeah. I want to ask you about what's going on in politics right now. The FBI is investigating the claims from these women. Republicans say there's no corroborating evidence uh, that Kavanaugh assaulted these women, and therefore it's not fair to hold these allegations. And we'll find out what the FBI turns up, if anything. Mm -hmm. But as of now, they are allegations against him. What do you say? Well, the problem I have, Jake, and I think a lot of Americans have, is that People were saying there's no corroborating evidence before they had, in fact, investigated and before uh, there'd been a chance to talk to a material witness, the person who was in the room when the alleged incident happened. Now, uh, that's what I, why I said the fix is in. I mean, why are you bum-rushing to a vote when you haven't yet fully investigated a serious allegation? Um, and I think, uh, obviously, uh, most Americans felt that. Uh, I think, additionally, a lot of people now, as a result of the last hearing, have questions about, you know, temperament and did he tell the truth about his lifestyle and those other choices. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do think um, it's relevant to whether or not he was truthful to the United States Senate, to the process, and that's the question. So uh, your book is great. Uh, it, it struck me at the beginning of the book, you talk about some of the encounters you had with the Kennedys, you're, yeah. you're, you're, um, including with President Kennedy. Yeah. Um, you write glowingly about Ted Kennedy. But I want to ask you, because I've heard Ted Kennedy's name invoked in the last week or two, and Bill Clinton's name invoked in the last week right. or two, um, by conservatives saying, yeah. you know, Democrats ceded the moral high ground on a lot of these sexual assault and sexual harassment issues by standing by people like Bill Clinton and Ted Kennedy because of the good things in their view that they did. Well, no, I think that's I, I don't think that's an accurate way to say it. Uh, many of us were very critical of President Clinton on the choice he made with respect to what happened in the White House. We just didn't believe, I didn't believe, let me speak for myself, that it was an impeachable offense. That's the issue. And, and uh, what about Ted Kennedy? Uh, similarly, people have been critical through the years where, and he was critical of himself. He stood up and owned moments where he knew he'd stepped over the line. So I think that, that, and he wasn't about to be nominated to a lifetime position. In fact, he said to the people of Massachusetts, if you think I shouldn't stay here, then, you know, and he took those returns and then he was elected another six times. That's a very different thing from a lifetime confirmation to the Supreme Court of the United States where you may have to rule on some of these issues that come up. And, and so, uh, you know, I think, uh, who was it today? Uh, there was an article written about, the, the, oh, it was Larry Tribe. And Larry Tribe, you know, may come from a particular uh, ideology and place in the spectrum, but he's a highly distinguished constitutional law professor, mm -hmm. somebody who was talked about for many years about being on the Supreme Court, but who, frankly, became part of that generation that wasn't able to ever be nominated because they'd written too much, because it was too much out there for people to play games with. So now we have this sort of vanilla uh, process by which justice, it doesn't mean they're not smart, doesn't mean they're not capable of justice. They're avoiding conflict. Yeah. But it avoids the, answering an awful lot of questions. The, the, nomin the, the con confirmation process has really become uh, how effectively can you avoid key questions on what you might do or what you've done. Right. And, uh, I, you know, it's too bad because I think there's a lot of legal talent that gets left by the wayside as a result. I want to I talk about your book. You write a great deal in the book uh, about the Iran deal, about which you're, you're, uh, you're very proud and you disagree with the administration very much right. on, on how they feel about it. 
It's become a controversy um, because you recently acknowledged that you stay in touch with the Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif. Well, that's that not you, the way I'd frame it, but go ahead. You said finish. you met with him three finish times. Finish your question. You, you've met with him before. Yes. You've talked to him. Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, and the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called the fact that you talked to him yeah. uh, unseemly and unprecedented. You say it's, it's not uncommon for diplomats to stay in touch. It's, it's not only is it not uncommon for diplomats to stay in touch, but the three times that I met, one at an Oslo conference on peace, two at the uh, Security Council meeting in uh, Munich where John McCain and, and other senators go, and he was present at that, and third at the UN General Assembly meetings in New York where I met with him outside mm -hmm. of, the, of the UN. And, and he met at the same time with editorial boards of newspapers, with the Council on Foreign Relations, and with other sitting senators, by the way. So it's not new, but most importantly, I met with him before the administration made a decision to pull out of the agreement. And there's nothing abnormal about that. I have never talked to them since the administration pulled out of the agreement. And, and what's, what's really important, I mean, Henry Kissinger, countless secretaries have met with um, people that they worked with or otherwise to be informed. I'm not negotiating anything. I'm not doing anything except Inform and, and exchanging opinions about where we are or aren't. It's helpful to the process, frankly. Mm. And I informed uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo of my point of view in a long telephone conversation that we had before they made the decision to pull out. We, and he was very cordial. We had a good conversation. So what I, do you make of the fact that they, they attacked that. you so Well, much. I think, you know, it happened on the day that Paul Manafort uh, cut a deal with Bob Mueller. Do you think they were trying to change the so subject? So I think it was partly changing the subject and sort of brush back and other things. It doesn't matter to me. What's important to me is, you know, as a citizen of the United States, we still have a right to meet with people and to talk with people and exchange opinions. And I wasn't negotiating anything. And the policy of the United States, when I met, was to live by the deal mm -hmm. until the president pulled out. Now he's pulled out. But what's in, and I haven't met with anybody since then. But what's interesting, Jake, is that last week in New York, Russia, China, France, Germany, Britain met with Zarif, and they all talked and agreed that they need to keep the deal. They're trying to keep the deal. Only Donald Trump has pulled out of this agreement. And so I think people have to step back and say, wait a minute, what does President Xi know? What does President Putin know? What a, what does the Chancellor of Germany know and the President of France and the Prime Minister of Britain who believe this deal is important to the safety and security of the world? I believe it is important to the world. We lost that opinion. The President's decided to pull out. And, and so we live with that. But it mm. doesn't mean I can't express my opinion. Of course not. We're, we're out of time. I want to recommend the book. You write in the book about your war experience in Vietnam, which I have never read you write so, so, so personally about. Well, before. I've never written about that. I've never written about yeah. the 04 election or many and, of the things in the book. And, and the loss of your friend Pershing, which I know was, yeah. was big too. But I do, I have to sneak in one quick 2020 question. It's like, sure. a, it's a 15 second answer. So, Go for it. okay. Yes, sir. Should the Democratic Party nominate somebody who is a fighting progressive or somebody who is from the tradition of the party that is more statesmanlike and moderate. Which side uh, do you think? I think the Democratic Party has to nominate the person whose vision for the future is one that they agree with and who they believe can beat Donald Trump. That's it. And that is not going to be decided by me or someone else pontificating. It's going to be decided in the primaries and in the process.